shut up and sit down. All right, welcome to the Square Ring Podcast, everybody. Episode 37. This week we had, this last weekend we had two shows. One where Jimmy Hart was there on Saturday and then a private show on Sunday. We have Bobby D and the Texan, Jim Holforth here as usual. How's it going, guys? Besides being tired. Yeah, how are you doing? Having fun. Right, right. Yeah, so uh, Saturday's show was, uh, was pretty cool. It was back at the Bell, uh, Belleville Fairgrounds. Uh, like you said, Jimmy Hart was in town for it. Actually, Jimmy Hart stayed uh, the whole weekend with us uh, going into our special show on Sunday, uh, which I think we're going to talk a lot about uh, just because of the, uh, the great part of that show. I mean, uh, I'm probably getting the words all tangled up in my head, but uh, well, anyway, we'll just get, we'll get to that show in a minute. So Saturday's show, um, you know, it was a good time. It was a good crowd. A lot of new fans uh, showed up. Um, I don't know if it's uh, part two, uh, all the advertising that uh, we do, our friends do, you know, uh, on Facebook, spreading the word. Um, I know, uh, you know, we were in the newspaper. Uh, you know, they uh, talked about how Jimmy Hart was going to be in town and how if you wanted to meet him, you can go to the fairgrounds. So, I mean, it could be a combination of everything that was going on. Um, Great wrestling. Yeah, of course, all of our, us uh, wrestlers, you know, um, I had a great match. Um, last couple of uh, months, uh, Toxic Masculinity, uh, Axe Allwork, and um, his partner, Mike, I can't remember his last name, but uh, they've been kind of doing this uh, spike pile driver uh, to a lot of the local wrestlers and uh, taking them out. Um, you know, they're a tag team. Uh, they've been kind of uh, wrestling around with uh, a wrestler named uh, Jason Breed. And we had, of course, we had Jason on the show before. Um, great guy. Uh, but he needed a tag team partner because his last partner, I think, got taken out by uh, that spike pile driver. So, uh, you know, he asked me to tag with him. Uh, we got it approved through the promoter, through the booker. And, uh, you know, we had a nice, it, it was a nice, good match. Uh, and it's so weird to me because it went by so quick. And I guess it's because I'm kind of used to being a single match, you know, uh, a single match, you know, um, not person, but uh, I'm just used to having single matches lasting 15, 20 minutes. Steel cage match here, steel in the cage match there. And it was nice to have that. It was nice to be in a tag match where I didn't have to do all the work. You know, uh, if I got winded or, or, you know, God forbid, forget how to do something, uh, you know, I was able to tag out uh, to Jason. He was, he, able, he was able to carry the load for our team. Um, but, uh, you know, they did uh, double team me uh, towards uh, the end of the match and got me down on the mat. Of course, I wasn't the legal person. Jason was. And since he was the legal person, they were going to do that spike uh, pile driver, which basically Axe puts him up in a spot, uh, the pile driver hold. And then Mike climbs the ropes and then jumps off and helps him drive the head of the opponent into the mat. Well, uh, you know, they thought they had me down. Uh, but as soon as they got in their spots where they needed to be, I was able to get back up and hit the ropes. I gave Axe a nice lariat. And, you know, you can see the video on YouTube or Facebook. But, man, I watched that uh, back the other day. And I clearly took his head off. Because there was no arm around the chest area or, you know, the base of the neck. No, it was like my forearm was against his cheek. Uh, I mean, I clearly just took his head. Uh, Mike was still on uh, the turnbuckle, and, uh, you know, he was like in his oh shit moment when he seen what I did to uh, Axe. So I just, uh, you know, gutted him, got him to bend over, and I suplexed him right off the, off the turnbuckle. Uh, you know, and then I, I actually threw uh, Jason, since he was the legal guy on our team, on top of Axe. We got the one, two, three. So, 
Um, great match. Uh, it's posted on my socials. I'm sure uh, Nathan can pull it if he wants to and put it on this. Um, but uh, uh, I was really proud of that I match. Didn't, you didn't. I didn't pull it because this one was supposed to be quicker than the two and a half hour one we had last time. <laughs> we'll try to make this one quicker. Um, um, I, I can't promise. Well, I will promise. I will. I will cut my own self off from talking. Uh, I mean, <laughs> last week it was it was mainly you and Bobby that did all the talking for two and a half hours, and I was sitting here like, "God, will they ever shut up?" Um, but that's this, right. this, yeah, this week I'll do uh, I'll try to do main, uh, the main part of the talking, so I can end myself and we can get the hell out. <clears throat> Sound good? I'll look at you. If you want to be a big baby, there you go. <laughs> yeah, so here they are there. Uh, now, I actually, they were double teaming uh, Jason at that moment, so I actually came in to try to break it up, and then they ended up double teaming me. Um, but, yeah, so they just, uh, I don't know, they did like this forearm, you know, axe handle thing to me, uh, both of them. Uh, which you probably can't see me. I'm on the corner, but yeah. So here's X, you know, setting Jason up for that pile driver, and of course Mike is climbing to the ropes. But <clears throat> there I come. Yeah, that's just perfect. I, you know, he was actually can't reach up there. <clears throat> since he was standing on the turnbuckle, it was kind of like the right height. You know, I was <laughs> just get him to bend over a little bit and it was it was so easy uh delivering that suplex so i mean it was great that, i don't um, think Bobby, how, i don't think how much people realize that shot that mike took with you coming off the with him coming down off the ropes how bad that does hurt i i tell you uh you know i wrestled uh, twice this weekend and for the most part my body is pretty loose and you know i still went to the gym today went to the gym yesterday uh, I always try to go to the gym right after I wrestle, you know, the, the day after I wrestle, try to loosen up the joints again because I get, my body gets pretty stiff. Um, but, uh, you know, even giving like a suplex, um, you know, you're still jolting your neck, you're still landing on your back as well, uh, except for you're giving more of the force behind it to your opponent. But, uh, yeah, my neck is still stiff. I haven't kind of worked out the kinks on it yet. Um, but, uh, you know, i am been in the business too long. I'm too old, uh, too fat, too ugly, something like that. But uh, it was definitely a great match. I had a great time. Like I said, it was, I haven't been used to a, a tag team match in a while. So just having someone else as a person I can tag in and, and get them going too. It made the match go by so quick and it was so easy. Um, I didn't really pay attention to a lot of the other matches. Um, I know one card, one match on the card. I know I was going to lead uh, lead to it. Uh, Bobby, you had a tag uh, team match on Saturday night. Yours was a tag team match too, wasn't it, Bobby? Yeah, that was a tag team match. Uh, first of all, I got a shout out to Jason Jones, uh, the Space Cowboy was there. Bought some of his uh, barbecue rub seasoning. If you get to a show, get some of that. That's pretty dang good. But the match. Uh, it was Flash Flanagan and myself against Glenn Williams and Sean Vincent. You look like you're pointing at something. Yo, Nathan, no, you're probably just yeah. distracted. I started talking like you're doing this. Like, what, what man? I can't see nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I know. It's bad. Jim's poster is gone and it's behind you now. <laughs> yeah. Actually, my poster just shifted to the next window over, so I don't, I don't know. He's, he's getting it ready for the next poster. That's that's true. I just got this one two months ago. Oh. <laughs> well, you, uh, got some, you got some barbecue rub from Space Cowboy. All I got was a whole bunch of smacks on the back. Oh, I'll give you those, too, anytime. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, the match... Uh, Everybody knows the uh, problems I've been having with Sean Vincent, like with the concerto last month and coming in uh, two weeks ago, hitting me from behind when I had Glenn Williams and the uh, sharpshooter. He comes in. He's not even in the match, hits me with the title. 
So got a little carried away, put him in the sharpshooter again, and didn't give a crap about getting disqualified. Uh, so you didn't let go and got disqualified for it, huh? Nope, just wanted to hurt him. There you go. Hey. Yeah, I, I did apologize to Flash. You know, you know, I, I didn't really care about the win. I just wanted to hurt him. Sometimes you got a lot of person know, you know, like you're you're not there to be messed around with. So I mean, I get yeah. it. It felt good. Doing and, we, that. and because we talk about the concerto that you received a lot, somebody on Instagram asked, how come I haven't posted that video? It's because I wasn't there, people. But I did talk to one of the other videographers, Brian of SICW. He mm -hmm. does have video of it, and I'll be able to get access to that here in the near future and put it out there for everybody to see. Yeah, uh, I mean, it was, I, I've seen the, the footage. I say, and, you uh, can go to Sean Vincent's page, too, and rip it off of there. He uh, loved posting it and bragging about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, Did you know, just maybe squeeze and hold that on a little bit longer. There you go. I'm sure it's not, your feud is not done, you know. No, because I already heard rumblings of him going around saying that he beat me. Which, oh. by technicality, he did, but he sure as hell wasn't walking out on his own. Wow. Well, it started with him getting a smack to the ass anyway, and he almost ran to the back after that. <laughs> well, uh, he still has your cup, too, don't he? He does. Another reason this is not over. Right, right. That's what I was thinking. I was thinking, man, normally there's a pretty cup, uh, you know, in the background, you know, that the, the belt sits in. But uh, it's haven't had that in uh, a little while, you know, should have it still, but haven't had it in a while. Right. Now, uh, the main event uh, Saturday was uh, Big Joe Helms uh, against Kowalski. Um, now, those are two big bulls that I faced myself uh, not too long ago individually. Same. Um, <laughs> right. And then, uh, you know, Kowal not Kowalski, Joe Helms kind of had a a change of faith, I guess, uh, because him, you know, he was part of uh, Kowalski's team with uh, Lucky P. Larson. The Dogtown uh, Underground. Dogtown Underground, of course. Uh, you know, he felt like they were turning their backs on him, which, you know, obviously they were, uh, kind of leaving him out to dry. So he was pretty much like, screw you guys, screw this team. And, um, you know, kind of went um, on the good side of things. Uh, so we've kind of taken him under our wing. Um, looks like I'm not done uh, trying to help him out because uh, that match didn't last too long. I didn't think it was going to because um, I knew, you know, having Lucky there, having the Hustlers there, you knew it was going to be a, a screwed finish somehow. Somehow they were going to get intertwined in that match, and of course they did. Um, you know, there was uh, handcuffs involved. Uh, they, uh, you know, handcuffed a Joe to the ropes and just pretty much uh, put a beat down to him. Uh, and then me and uh, I think uh, the Top Guns, uh, might have been some other people. Uh, Curtis, I think, might have been one. But we all ran down to the ring, kind of shoot off uh, the Hustlers and, and Kowalski. And, um, you know, Lucky, uh, well, I want to say Lucky that we had a fan in the audience and not Lucky P. Larson. Lucky P. Larson actually had the key, but when we ran him off, of course, he took the key with him. So Joe was actually stuck, handcuffed to the ropes, and we had no key to get him out. But lucky, lucky enough, there was a fan who has been coming to SICW as, as long as I've been in, in SICW, uh, Robert, uh, who uh, is a you know, security guard. And, you know, most handcuff keys are the same key, you know, and uh, he was able to actually whip out his handcuff keys, and we were actually able to unlock Joe. Um, security you know. guard at Larry Slint's. No. <laughs> <laughs> hey, there's now, a lot of valuable stuff there. <laughs> yeah, a lot of bonding. <laughs> it's not Larry Flint's, but it's still, uh, 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 you know, I actually don't even know the name of it, but, you know, he. Uh, Gentleman's Club? No, it's, uh, he does security for uh, uh, a pot, uh, this, you know, uh, dispensary. 
uh, you know, oh. makes pretty damn good money from what I heard too. So, you know, there's a lot of money in that stuff. Yeah. Uh, a lot, but, of, uh, lot of danger in it too since the bank still can't take the money yeah so it's uh i mean it's a good thing that robert was there um and uh, he was able to unlock him um but yeah that was saturday's uh show and of course you know i don't want to take anything away from jimmy hart because he was there he uh in, he introduced us to the crowd you know right before the show started uh, you know he got out there hyped up the crowd for us and and was able to meet them during intermission and interact and did a great job. Jimmy Hart does a great job. Uh, and he's one hell of a nice guy. Right. And he is. Uh, Sunday is uh, the show that I think we're going to spend a lot of our time talking about. Um, the start- picture? Yes. Um, uh, Bobby, that I'm picture was to- provided by Bobby D. I'm going to butcher the Stole it off of somebody else's Facebook. I'm not a, I'm not a big picture taker. You know, one thing that makes a wife mad about a lot, you know, we go out with the kids and whatnot. I don't take a lot of pictures, but I, you know, usually find the pictures. Uh, I'm going to butcher the name of this room. Um, how, how do you pronounce that, Bobby? Coruscant. Coruscant room. So the Coruscant ballroom is, uh, where wrestling at the chase started now if you grew up in st louis if you lived in st louis visited your grandparents who lived in st louis back in the 60s 70s and 80s you grew up watching wrestling uh wrestling at the chase and And from and from doing this from listening to all the legends that have come through if it wasn't for St. Louis and wrestling at the chase, there wouldn't be a WWE. There wouldn't be the following that wrestling has now. Uh, I don't know about that. Um, because, uh, you know, it's still a territory system. It was NWA and it was the second part of the NWA because there's two part, two NWAs. Uh, NWA was a national wrestling association and National Wrestling Alliance, Alliance. So, um, you know, one was pretty much ran by uh, Lou Fez and the other one by Sam Mushnick. Um, and then eventually uh, they worked together. Uh, they were rivals and then uh, they conformed just one. Um, so Sam Mushnick pretty much will help start the NWA and then he was the president i think five or six times uh, during his span and it wasn't like one year two years uh he was elected so many times but uh and that's to the current nwa as as we know now Uh, of course the territory system kind of folded uh vince mcmahon senior actually pulled out of the nwa and did his own territory, which was the New York uh, territory. So to say that if it wasn't for St. Louis, there wouldn't be no WWF or WWE, uh, probably the opposite there. Because since Vince pulled out and of course Junior bought it, and once Junior bought it, you know, it was gonna be the crazy company that it is now, that is now owned by Endeavor um you know and then that's a story on its own um however i do agree that wrestling at the chase was a big part of wrestling um and anyone who made it big into wrestling or even made it big in the wwe or f at the time did come through st louis uh, because if you wanted to make it big you had to spend some time under sam mushnick uh, so you got the Ric Flair's, the Harley Race, the Pat O'Connor's, uh, you know, Lou Thez was still wrestling uh, f- for a little bit of that time, but then he turned ref uh, for for Sam. Um, but, uh, you know, John Studd, um, you know, uh, Rocky Maivia, you know, they all came through the St. Louis territory. King Kong Bruiser Brody uh, came through. So, I mean, Cowboy Bob Eric. Uh, so the who's who of the wrestling world, uh, 
Primo Show came through St. Louis, and then Sam Mushnick made them the star. Uh, you know, a lot of people say that he was a great payoff man, uh, and he gets that a lot. A lot of legends toss that out, and some people don't understand why they say that. Um, but back in the day, most pr promoters worked for themselves. You know, it was a, a money-hungry business. And the less the promoter would give to the wrestler, the more the promoter had. And Sam didn't do it that way. Sam had a philosophy on where you were placed on the card, if you're the opener, if you're the main eventer, if you're in a tag match, a singles match. And everyone knew how they were going to get paid. So if they knew that they were opening the card, they knew what they were going to get. And I say that because it was a percentage of the house. And like even in um, some interviews that you'll hear, you know, Herb Simmons will say, if your percentage equaled out to $75.87 and in your paid envelope, you even had the 87 cents because he paid the wrestlers down to the penny. Um, and that's why a lot of people say he was a good payoff man because he wasn't a promoter that was going to stick it to the wrestler and try to, be greedy and take all the money for himself. Um, there was enough money to be made in St. Louis, uh, you know, thanks to uh, the wrestling at the chase, the TV show, uh, because uh, Sam, unlike a lot of bookers, um, they would put uh, a main event match on the TV program. Uh, Sam did it a, a different way. Sam would build the storyline on the TV programs and they would end at the keel or end at the checker dome. So you would be able to see for free the build up, but to see the climax, you would actually have to go to the checker dome, spend the money, uh, at, you know, to see how it would end. Um, and that's what kind of made St. Louis separate from all the others. Plus Sam didn't, Sam wouldn't go for any bullshit. Um, you know, uh, a lot of people would it, say it's strict, but, uh, you know, you couldn't toss your opponent over the top rope or you'd get disqualified. If you jumped off uh, the top rope onto your opponent, you'd get disqualified. He wanted pure wrestling inside the ropes. Um, did it happen where people got outside the ring and, you know, and wrestled? Yes. Um, but, uh, you know, he was more of a pure wrestling inside the ring type of promoter. So he didn't put up with a lot of other crap. Uh, he didn't put up with people and their gimmicks. You know, back in the day, there was a guy named, I can't think of his actual name, but his uh, gimmick name uh, was Moose something. And he would literally have a big giant moose head with the horns. And he would put it on his head and bring it down to the ring. And sometimes you can look it up on YouTube. It's funny too, because sometimes, you know, he would try to squeeze between the ropes to get inside the ring with this big ass moose head on. And, you know, he would look really stupid sometimes and not to, you know, uh, say bad things about the guy because I don't know him personally, but you know, you, we all kind of look stupid sometimes doing things, but he would, it wasn't necessary for him to look stupid. All he had to do is take the damn moose head off. So, uh, you know, it's plenty of interviews saying Sam would like, you keep that shit in your car. You come to the ring like a real man, you know? Um, so, I mean, it, wrestling at the chase was the biggest thing in the St. Louis area. And I kind of, kind of marked down some things. Now, uh, I, here lately, you know, there was a book, uh, there was a movie, uh, Larry Matisic had his own book. Um, I'm going to just run through some details about it. So, uh, Sam Mushnick and a guy named Harold Poplar, who uh, a lot of people know that, uh, KPLR, uh, channel 11 was, uh, owned by the Coplers. Um, he owned the hotel, you know, uh, the Chase Park Plaza. Um, and this place was like the most happening place in St. Louis at the time. You know, you had uh, the Rat Pack, uh, Rat Pack would play there. 
Uh, presidents would be staying there in and out of that place. Um, and he had this brilliant idea of like, we should film this and let everyone in the world see it. Uh, so he bought, he bought a, uh, a network, uh, well, not bought a network, he created his own network and started filming everything. So, uh, you know, that's how you had some films of, uh, uh, you know, Frank Sinatra singing in there and stuff like that. Um, but just on a chance airplane ride, Harold Coppler and Sam Mushnick was on the same plane and they were talking and they struck a deal right there on the ride. Um, most people say it was a handshake deal. Other people say they wrote the actual deal on an airplane napkin. But either way, uh, Sam Mushnick created Wrestling at the Chase and put it on Channel 11 out of that ballroom. And this ballroom, uh, back in the day, you had to be dressed to the nines, you know, the, the, the tuxes and the evening gowns and everything to get into this ballroom. It was such a high class and uh, to see wrestling, you know, it, it's so crazy that, uh, you know, nowadays you look at uh, the audience and some are dressed nice, some dress like they just rode out of bed and walked in and others straight out of work, you know, but to, to be at wrestling at the chase when it first started, you had to, uh, you know, be fancy looking, but, uh, it actually, you know, ran at the ballroom for a long period of time. Um, I think, let's see here. Well, actually the, the first name was, uh, Joe Gariola. Um, I'm, I'm bad with pronouncing the last name Gariola, um, wrestling at the chase. And that's kind of how they got the, the name started because Joe was, uh, you know, St. Louis Cardinals catcher, uh, well known in the St. Louis area. He retired and became an announcer for the St. Louis Cardinals. Um, and then they were able to pull him in and have him announce the wrestling shows. So you had a famous uh, wrestling announcer that everyone knew. Uh, and that's kind of what got people's attention as well. Um, now, uh, Joe didn't really know much about wrestling. So sometimes when he was talking about wrestling, it didn't really make sense or he called the wrong thing, you know, the wrong hold something else. But, uh, so it, it kind of made it fun to, to watch too. But, uh, uh, let's see here. So May, it was a Saturday, May 23rd, 1959 was the first airing of wrestling at the chase almost lasted 25 years. Uh, what mainly changed the course of wrestling at the chase was when the TV went from black and white to color and, uh, it changed it so much because the cameras were so heavy and so big, um, that they couldn't roll the cameras from the studio to the ballroom like they did with the black and white cameras. Um, so in order to help with that they changed the location it was still on the same property because the studio uh channel 11 studio was on the same property as the chase so they still kept the same name wrestling the chase but uh they had it at the studio uh and that's when it was in in color so in the ballroom you know it would hold like a thousand you know fans at the studio it would only hold like 300 so with a uh, you know, kind of sucks for the fans, but it's, it's the same theory is still applied. They used the wrestling show, the build up to, you know, the main event, which would be held at, you know, the bigger places, the checker dome and everything. Um, but the whole reason why I'm bringing this up is because that ballroom, we wrestled in there Sunday. Uh, they have, you know, the history of this ballroom is so grand because so many famous wrestlers came through there. Uh, and you know, that, that hotel, you know, the Copplers eventually sold that hotel. Uh, and then the new owners ran it for a little bit and closed it down. And then 
miraculously someone bought it and spent a hundred million dollars to refix that thing up. But the constant in that hotel and in that ballroom is the same light fixtures in the ceiling uh, are the same ones today. So they That's were right. able to restore them and keep them there. So I was say, I'm watching these photos, you know, go through and it kind of looks it's like little stars in the sky on there, and that's those legendary lights. Yes. You see them right up there, right above Fender there. They call them uh, <laughs> gas. Well, no, they call them starlights. Or, uh, it, it, they have their own name. But uh, uh, I even, like, during my match with Steve Fender, as you guys are seeing different pictures, and there's no, there is a video of our show, um, but it, the hotel actually videotaped it. Um, so eventually I'm assuming at some point in time, we'll get a copy and be able to show it, or you can, you know, follow uh, SICW all-star wrestling on YouTube and Facebook, and it might pop up there sometime. So they were I mean, the like hotel that was, uh... right there is a great shot with you well, and the top guns, Bobby. It just, it looks like you're outside and there's nothing but, Starry night, spans and stars. <laughs> just right. an awesome spot. That recording that they did had to be pretty badass too, because they were playing on a projector. I was actually watching the end of your match, Texan, where uh, yeah. just like the quick shots and the roaming cameras. Like I was watching that projection of it the whole time, and it just had a whole different feel to it. Oh, I mean, uh, there's nothing I can tell anyone to this how to describe it. Um, there was a point in time in my match where Fender had done something to me and I was laying down on my back, looking up at the ceiling. And I was, uh, I got amused by the lights. Uh, you know, it was so crazy, you know, seeing that because you never been in, I've never wrestled in a ballroom before, before. Well, I guess the Mac, I guess that could be a ballroom. Um, but and not saying that the Mac isn't historic, and it's had its own history because it has That's a, it's an electric experience too yes um but there's something about wrestling at the place that really put st louis on the map for wrestling yes there was wrestling before wrestling at the chase and sam mushnick even had its his a uh, tv show prior to wrestling at the chase um it was on channel five um and it was like something like wrestling all stars or uh, something to that matter, um, and it only lasted a couple of years. But how the TV progressed is when TV first came on, they didn't have a whole lot of programming, uh, but the one consistent program was wrestling. Whatever market you were in, whatever city you were in, that city had their own local wrestling shows and it was easy to tape them and throw them on the air um but when sam first got on the air there was so much wrestling that was getting you know sent in because chicago was big in wrestling so we would get uh shows from there we would uh, uh you know hell just like today you know there's so much wrestling out there that it actually hurt the business for a little while and uh, they pulled it off the air. And then, you know, uh, KPR Channel 11, you know, took another shot to try to revise it. Uh, and it became one of their main shows because at one point in time, there was more people watching wrestling at the chase than the St. Louis, St. Louis Cardinals baseball games, uh, uh, than the local uh, nighttime news. Uh, so, I mean, it was so popular uh, for so long because what I say, it started in 59 and it, it didn't end until like 83. Um, so, I mean, the movie that Nate's got playing in the background, that's uh, Head Over Heels. Um, it uh, was kind of done by Ed Wheatley. He's also the gentleman that did the coffee book. But just real paper. quick, while you're while you're watching this and you're talking, like, look at all these legends that are flashing across that screen too, and they've all wrestled there. 
Right. Now, see, since it's in color, this is actually at the studio, but any footage that you've seen that was in black and white, uh, that was at the ballroom. Uh, so, you, you know, you had, uh, like, Bobo Brazil was there, uh, you know, uh, Crusher was a Crusher Blackwell, and... Um, There's Dusty <laughs> doing his dance. Yes, I mean, everyone who was everyone, uh, you know, came through St. Louis. Uh, but, you know, so my match, you know, I don't know. Holy crap, that was Kramer's dead. I said, you see them lights up there? It was so weird to prepare for the match because you're, you're in like awe the whole time you're even at the building. Well, that's what, when I get there at the show, you know, I'm usually trying to figure out where I'm going right away. I go and set my bag down, don't pay attention too much yet. And then I come back upstairs and I'm like just soaking everything in, just seeing it and like just in awe. And then I get called over to Herb to do an interview real quick. I, I couldn't even find my words. And that's what I told him in the interview. I'm like, there's just so much history in here. I don't know what to say. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I got there early enough. I helped set up the ring early in the morning. So I was roaming around the whole hotel, kind of get a, a feel for the place. And, you know, I had been there for the NWA, you know, 75. You know, uh, NWA did their 74 uh, two years ago and then 75 this year. And, and there's rumors that they're going to come back for next year for 76 uh, because they, too, Billy Corgan's NWA version. Uh, they know how big wrestling was in St. Louis and how big the NWA was in St. Louis. So he even, you know, is trying to rekindle that and, and try to get, uh, you know, that to help him, you know, launch his NWA version uh, to the world. And and it's, and it's doing it, you know, because uh, he announced – Last week that he signed uh, a TV deal. Now he uh, is, was mainly on Fight and mainly on YouTube, uh, but he announced that he's going to be two TV shows he's going to have um, on the top. He didn't say which channel, but he said it was a top 20 TV programming channel. So um, he hasn't announced anything else about it yet. But he, then he also announced that you know he's trying to bring back the territories. So, you know, more power to them. Um, but, uh, again, wrestling there was, I was so awestruck. Uh, you know, when you go through that curtain on the stage, knowing all these other wrestlers had that same, you know, feeling going through the curtain, going down the ramp and into the ring. Um, and, uh, you know, the people that were there, these were – classy people these were i hate to say it but people with money uh you know as a private show it was there to make money for another organization um so they were spending money you know what i'm saying um so i mean it, it kind of gave it the the same feel you know people with money you know being in there dressed in their fine you know uh, i mean people weren't dressed in suits and evening gowns like they did in the back back then but, you know, they were on the higher end scale of things. Um, but coming out to the ring and seeing the fans. Sorry, let me kick my dog out of my way here. I need she a dog or one of the cats. Go. Nate, there's also another good picture. Uh, I just saw her post it today where they had the mobile uh, St. Louis Wrestling Hall of Fame up, and he's just kind of standing there, the camera's behind him, just soaking it all in up there. Right. That'll be another good one to post up there. Just kind of draws it all together. I mean, I don't, know how, I don't know how Bobby felt, but so the first time that I'm there wrestling at the chase, uh, you know, I'm the main event. I'm, you know, holding – the belt that you know st louis wrestling hall of fame this is this belt is made for everyone who wrestled at the chase 
You know, you got the NWA on the belt. You got all the names of the people that are already in the Hall of Fame that wrestled at the, at wrestling at the Chase, and even people that helped build wrestling at the Chase. You know, Sam Mushtick's name's on here. Larry Massick's mm -hmm. name's on here. Um, so, you know, it was such an honor for me to to be the main event one, uh, to be carrying the belt that honors them. So I was able to de defend it and able to retain it. Um, you know, someone put it, I think you already played it, but they put together that little package of pictures for me and threw my theme music in it. And, uh, I mean, it was, I'm so glad that they were able to take pictures. And I'm so looking forward to the video uh, because this is like a once in a lifetime achievement. And for me, besides being, you know, besides from the NWA, you know, SICW being the first group to come back and wrestle there and uh, be the main event for that place. I mean, it, it was beyond words to me. Oh yeah. Like I'm in the house that was built by legends and I'm tagging with the future legend and Brandon Beretta. Uh -huh. so, I mean, I had the, both the past and the present with me. Or the past and the house. Well, so, yeah, I want to say the future because he is current. He is the cur current. Well, he's current and future. <laughs> Brandon, if you're watching, thank you for the house. Right, right. <laughs> so, I'm sure he had a part to deal with getting us at the chase. You know, uh, his physique and his uh, wrestling ability. Probably, you know, they just came to a show one night and seen him and like we got to get him on our stage yeah, probably just a headshot probably just a headshot photo and they're like we need him right right so, I so just there's a picture the bobby was talking about with herb that is herb right yeah, yeah. just so soaking it all in like finally back where it all started you know of course herb didn't take this picture because we're looking at the back side of him uh but this picture says a thousand words. Uh, again, everyone whose name is on my belt has a picture on that wall. And, you know, his best friend, Larry, is on that wall. And Larry is the one who got him involved in the wrestling. You know, of course, Herb will always talk about uh, growing up in East St. Louis and uh, taking the TV from the front room outside you know, they would have an extension cord and take it outside because, you know, they didn't have, you know, heat and AC. So everyone spent most of their time outside. And uh, he said it, it turned into like a community uh, that so many people would come over and just stay outside and watch wrestling. So, I mean, he was already involved being a fan, but then he became friends with Larry, who became the protege to Sam Mushnick. I mean, it was like uh, a perfect tragedy right there, you know, where everything kind of, I hate that we would use tragedy, that's the wrong word, but everything kind of fell in line. You know, Sam was doing the wrestling at the chase, Larry started working for him, her became his best friend, they worked together, you know, because even, you know, I gotta give Larry props here real quick. This is Larry's book. Uh, wrestling at the chase uh, and it's you know this is a great read uh, you know Larry's first hand accounts of being the ring announcer uh, on camera and then behind camera he was everything for Sam you know uh, Sam you know was the head honcho but when it came to writing uh, uh, stuff for the wrestling magazines that was Larry uh, when it came to booking wrestlers for the hotel or how they were going to get there or how they were going to leave, that was all Larry. <laughs> but Larry did all the behind-the-scenes work uh, as well. But that is a great read. Um, and then, like I said, Ed Wheatley, this is uh, mainly a, like a coffee table book. This one is a lot of pictures. So if you're into pictures and not reading, you know, this one is a great book to get. Because uh, 
it goes over from start to finish about wrestling and the chase as well. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but that painting of Bruiser Brody, didn't that sell at the auction a couple of weeks ago? Or is that a different one in that picture? Uh, so uh, that is something that uh, Nick, uh, our head ref, does. Um, he makes those. And I'm sure that might be the original one, but he sells so copies. An artist painted that on canvas. That's a canvas up there. And then what's being sold are prints of that canvas one. And they also had that printed on shirts too, which I've worn out there in the ring. But yeah, so you have uh, both books and then the Head Over Heels uh, movie uh, that you can watch. And the movie isn't too long. It's only about an hour. Uh, Bobby will probably tell you that the best part of the movie is the last 10 seconds of it. Um, well, that one, and there's a little, a few minutes before that, too. <laughs> well, let's just see what you guys are talking about, yeah? Uh, that was part of it there. <laughs> yeah, so they're just going through kind the of talking about how wrestling kind of broke barriers and brought everybody together, I think is what that uh, little spiel there was. In this part, they're talking about how, you know, uh, WWF kind of swooped in. And, you know, this is, uh, I think, uh, the Royal Rumble when they came to St. Louis. Yep. Either that or Survivor Series, one or two. No, you're uh, right. It's time, it's the Royal Rumble. Uh, but, yeah, so it uh, kind of shows how it morphed into uh, WWE coming and taking over. But uh, you'll see it one. Once once you see it on the screen, you know what I, I'll be talking about. <laughs> well, you said a couple minutes before, so I, you know, well, oh, it's two it's minutes. Hard. It's uh, coming up. Jim said about 10 seconds before. No, but you said a couple minutes before. That's why I stopped a couple well, minutes before. Forward. There was a, we did a St. Louis history. St. Louis, was it the broadcasting history? No. Uh, so. Oh, uh, Broadcasting what it was is, uh, when our good friend Trevor Murdoch won the NWA heavyweight belt, uh, his first title defense was against Attila Khan, and uh, the St. Louis Sports Hall of Fame. Sports Hall of Fame. Sam Mushnick, uh, let's see, Larry Manisek, and I want to say Joe, either Joe or Mickey. Uh, Gergiola. I hope I'm pronouncing that last name right. Uh, <laughs> so uh, they're doing uh, the Hall of Fame for them. Oh, right this is, this is the part. Look how classy <laughs> this was. This was the probably the best ending that a local wrestler could have had. And I'm going to tell you a secret. When it premiered, all of us were invited to watch the premiere of this uh, movie. Um, <laughs> and it was open to the public, too. It was outside. It was beautiful because uh, it was a nice, cool night. Uh, you know, they uh, had a little liquor flowing. The wrestling ring was put up for display. Uh, we were watching this. And, you know, us local wrestlers would, you know, give pops, you know, uh, you know, clapping, shouting. Whenever we would see one of us on the TV, well, on, on the show, you know, because Cowboy Bob Orton and the Ace Academy was uh, uh, shown. Some of the matches from this Hall of Fame that we were talking about was shown. And that right there is Bobby posing on the turnbuckle to close out the movie. And the secret to this is Bobby wasn't even there. <laughs> The man that had the best scene in the movie for a local wrestler wasn't even there to see it. I say I know I was doing something with kids wrestling. I don't remember what it was, but I remember getting a lot of messages. <laughs> oh my god! I mean, I wish I still had it on my phone because I videotaped it. And I was calling Bobby. He's like, "Oh my god, you won't believe this," you know, um, because you know he's etched in history. He's we're all etched in his history right now because um, wrestling at the chase, man, 
and to be part of that. Um, I say where we were going with that story before we got to that was at that show is uh, some clips of me and I believe against Sean Vincent of all people at that right? show. But it was so cool. And, uh, you know, my posts, when I post the repost of these pictures that they sent me that you're showing, uh, you know, I, I wrote a little article uh, saying that, you know, this has come full circle for me because, you know, my father is the one that got me into wrestling. And uh, he would, uh, you know, he worked two jobs. So to get some time with my father uh, was special. And, you know, it always uh, revolved around wrestling. So we would watch wrestling together, whether it be old school WWF, you know, I've always said that, but he would also watch the wrestling at the chase. Now, my time of watching wrestling at the chase is after it got taken off the air, every couple of years, they would do, um, they would throw it back on the air. You know, um, what's, what's it called when they do that? Uh, uh, rerun, a rerun, a rerun, a retrospect. Well, they, it, it was reruns, so uh, we would watch the reruns uh, of the wrestling at the chase. And this, the book that I'm shown from Larry of wrestling at the chase, this is actually signed by Larry uh, for my dad. My dad actually went and, and got this book. Uh, so he met with Larry, and Larry signed it to Rob, which is my father. Uh, so, I mean, that's even more special to me because, you know, Larry was the man behind it, and now I got to wrestle at it. So, I mean, it, it's totally full circle. Um, I do want to throw some other things out there. Uh, so, you know, it switched, you know, when they got color. In 1967, that's when they moved to the studios. Um, 69 is when uh, Joe kind of went away and Mickey, his brother, came and became the announcer. And then Larry Matisek, like I said, he came along. Uh, he was first just behind the scenes and then he started doing uh, the play-by-play -play, uh, with Mickey. Um, but then Sam retired in 83. Well, no, Sam retired Early 83, maybe late 82. I can't remember the date. I'm sure a lot of people out there would probably correct me on it. However, when Sam retired, he sold his shares of the business to some wrestlers. Um, and that kind of makes it hard um, when you have one person running it, basically. And now you have a committee of people running it. Um, now you have a bunch of people trying to butt heads on on how they think it should be ran. And Larry was still, they made him in charge because um, these, uh, the bunch of people that, are, that owned it now were wrestlers like Harley Race. And I want to say Pat O'Connor um, was part of it, but there's some other wrestlers. Uh, I want to say Greg, uh, not Greg, Vern Gagne was, had a little holding in it. Uh, but they couldn't, get everything out right, you know, they, they didn't have a focus. So Larry actually broke away in 83 and created his own wrestling promotion. And at the time, the other guys were trying to keep wrestling at the chase on the TV. Um, but this is when Vince McMahon came in and was trying to swoop up all the TV programming and all the cities and, uh, and pretty much Larry folded after only three months of being in the, having his own promotion. And at the same time, uh, the wrestling at the chase folded because uh, the TV got pulled from him. So without the TV, there's no buildup for the arena shows and stuff like that. So both uh, ended up coming off the air. Uh, and then the WWF uh, came uh, to KPLR. And they were called superstars of wrestling. Um, but that pretty much ended the wrestling at the chase. Now, the superstars of wrestling, their first couple of shows, they wrestled in, in that ballroom. Uh, so you have the likes of Hulk Hogan, 
wrestling at the chase. And they even ref referenced wrestling at the chase for the first few shows, trying to convince people to switch over to their stuff, that their stuff is just a continuation of the St. Louis history and tradition. But, uh, you know, it totally wasn't. It was like apples to oranges on uh, what the chase was like versus what Vinny Mac wanted his wrestling to be like. Uh, but, you know, uh, the funny thing is Larry went to go work for Vince, and he did that for like a decade, 10 years or so. And then uh, I think he kind of got upset with how Vince was running things and quit. And that's when he hooked up again with Herb Simmons. And, you know, him, you know, Larry and Herb, uh, were the ones that really was the driving force between uh, from SICW, you know. So you had Larry's mind being the booker, and uh, and her being the promoter. And you know, when I started, when Larry first came over, because I think I I came over to her before Larry was actually in it full time like that. Mm -hmm. um, got getting to know Larry. I mean, Larry. <laughs> was just awesome. He was such a friendly, down to earth guy, and uh, I didn't realize it until later on that we lived like a mile away from each other. Uh, so I mean, he lived pretty damn close to each other, and uh, sometimes I would get phone calls from Larry, uh, or sometimes after the shows, we would all meet up at a Denny's or. Uh, uh, yeah, mainly mine was Denny's. I know a lot of times that he went to, uh, uh, what's the place with the, it's here in Belleville, but it folded right next to the Taco Bell down on West, uh, on uh, uh, Steak and Shake. That was Larry's favorite place to eat was Steak and Shake. Uh, but we always seemed to, to go to Denny's when I, when I was with them. Uh, but just to have Larry's mind in our locker room and working on the scenarios for us, man, it was great. I kind of wish I would have hung out more with Larry. Uh, towards the end of Larry's life, you know, he uh, uh, health-wise kind of fell. Um, you know, he was kind of going down. And I actually went and visited him at uh, the nursing home that he was in prior to him passing. And it was funny, too, because when I opened my dad's book, it had, uh, you know, the thing that they give you at the funeral homes uh, for them. So even uh, my dad kept a hold of that. But, yeah, so wrestling at the chase, you know, if you were in St. Louis, if you grew up in St. Louis, knew anything about St. Louis, you knew about wrestling at the chase. And I just wanted to take the time. And, you know, we can make it short because I don't know how long we're going uh, or how long we've gone. But uh, we've gone an hour, but the rest is up to you two. It sounds like one of you or both of you are getting the head cold that I already have and that Herb has. That's why he's not on tonight. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, we will probably have Herb uh, on. Now, next week, uh, I do have uh, a special guest coming back on. He has been on before. James Beard is coming back because uh, uh, his movie that he helped advise on and he's in uh, is coming out now. It's not coming out for a while. I think December is its release uh, month. Uh, but, yeah, but they I, just released a commercial for it, didn't they? Yeah, they released uh, they released a trailer for it, and well, the trailer play. is let's really good. That. The movie's called The Claw. Uh, the Iron Claw. The Iron Claw. And it's based off of uh, the Von Erichs, uh, the family of the Von Erichs, basically. Now, I, I do want to say that Kevin, uh, the sole survivor of the Von Erichs of that destiny, uh, is not involved in the movie. Um, but uh, I heard his boys, you know, he's got a... a, a two boys that are actually in wrestling now, uh, they favor the movie. So, um, you know, from the looks of the trailer, it looks really good. So anyway, we're going to get James Beard back on. He's going to talk about, you know, the behind the scenes of the making of the movie, what parts that he advise on. And 
He's got some pictures of the stars. Uh, Zach, Zach Efron is one of the main players in the movie. And um, he's got pictures with him and uh, pictures, because uh, I know he's ref like some of the matches that got in the movie. Uh, so he's got pictures of, of that happening. So we just want to get his take on the movie because James Beard actually lived that life of the WCCW era, like towards the tail end, and then with the Jarrett's coming over and taking it over, and then the turmoil of all the legends that had the passings, you know, even, you know, like the Von Erics themselves, you know, with the suicides and everything going on. But yeah, so that's next week. But after that, I do want to get Herb's take on this past weekend because I know it's got to be full circle for him, you know, watching it as a kid, always dreaming about going back there with his own promotion and then having the opportunity uh, and then, you know, season it. And, uh, and I know he, uh, talking to him throughout the day, Sunday, uh, you know, he was like stressed to the gills because uh, he just wanted the best wrestling show he could for being back at the chase. Uh, and uh, I know he kind of got sick towards the end of that day. Uh, so he he stayed for all the wrestling. But uh, after the wrestling, you know, uh, uh, we haven't even talked about this. After the wrestling, they, they fed us. Um, they, uh, you know, gave us some drinks. So it was, you know, we sat around for probably a, uh, an hour, hour and a half or so, uh, you know, drinking, eating, socializing. Uh, and it was good to sit with the boys and kind of take so it all, good. you know, because uh, we were in the ballroom eating and everything. So we were just able to absorb it all. And I love the fact, you know, it hit up all the wrestlers uh, for SICW uh, social medias because everyone's posting pictures. You know, some of the wrestlers were taking pictures. They asked us not to take any pictures because uh, they didn't want to, you know, anything to interfere with their camera work. Um, but, uh, you know, you know us, we had to sneak some pictures. Uh, we had our photographer there taking pictures. Uh, uh, so Adam was taking, you know, even Erica, um, the other photographer that we normally have, she, well, she was taking pictures too, and she got my entrance and all that stuff. Uh, so that was very cool. Uh, but the pictures that uh, you were showing earlier of my match, I think those are all Adams. Uh, so I got another set that I can give that, uh, that's Erica's. Uh, but either way, uh, it was just a very cool thing for us to do. And uh, probably uh, the highlight uh, of probably of my wrestling career, uh, I would have to say. Uh, it was just awesome. Um, I didn't have that good of a time where I was. <laughs> <laughs> well, you were probably stuck at work still, huh? <laughs> yep, I was at the store, and uh, my leg decided not to work by the end of the day. Yeah. Ended up hitting the pavement. Yeah, that, that kind of sucks. Um, it was but yeah, I had a great time. <laughs> I, and, you know, there's rumors... I talked to a couple of the people because it's a committee that kind of runs things in that building now. And uh, they, two of them said that they had a great time and would love to have us back. And I chimed in and said, we'll come back anytime you want. You know, uh, you know, if they can make this a yearly thing, uh, I'm sure Herb would love it. And every single one of us would love it as well. Um, you know, so I, I hope uh, truly it becomes a, uh, uh, a yearly thing that would be great just like just like the Mac you know we talked about the Mac a couple times and we always talked about how that was the closest uh, mm -hmm. feeling to wrestling at the chase that us boys could um, experience but now we experience the true thing so uh, it would be great to, to have that as a repeat show every year um, I mean that would be great but uh, so yeah, uh, next couple weeks, you know, we'll probably have Herb on. We're definitely having James Beard on next week. 
Um, if there's anyone else uh, that you would like us to get uh, in SICW, you know, let us know. Um, I'm still waiting on you guys to uh, give me your top 10 list. Uh, I know we're kind of like seven, eight months away from the Fan Fest, um, but I know some of you have posted on Facebook your top 10. I would love to get uh, get it on our videos, um, and that way, you know, Herb can see them, and maybe we can work something out and, and uh, try to get some of the fans' perspective in there on who to book. Uh, it, it'll be great. Um, again, please yeah, like, talk. share, comment on these videos. If you think we're doing great, let us know. If you think we're doing shitty, you can let us know. We won't pay attention. But you can still let us know about it. Uh, you know, uh, I think we do this out of fun, anyhow. Um, you know, it's a lot of useless knowledge up in here um, that I like to get out. Sometimes I guess it clears space for me, uh, so I can continue on uh, absorbing other useless knowledge. Um, but uh, yeah, just let us know how we're doing. Um, there's like I said, there's no way for me to describe what we went through this weekend, uh, but I guess the best way to put it, it was probably the best day of my life in my wrestling career, I, I would say. Uh, if you guys want to close it out, I'm good to go. Yeah, I was just going to say, uh, they, people submit those lists, we'll talk about them, and maybe put our list and see if anything overlaps. I'm very much sure it will. All right. Well, we're uh, down to the wire there. So, uh, you know, um, <laughs> let's just say uh, for the Square Ring podcast, uh, thanks for tuning in. I know you guys are going to see this in a couple of days, but let us know your feedback. And um, uh, maybe we'll talk about what you have to say next week. But for the Squared Ring Podcast, you guys have a good week. I'll see you this weekend, most of you. We uh, probably won't talk about what they have to say next week because James is going to be on next week. So I'll be talking about the Von Erics and the movie. There you go. So the oh, week after, we'll, we'll talk about your people. <laughs> All right, guys. You have a good weekend. A good week. I'll see you guys on the weekend.